N1, N1 DAY. He lives in Flat Rock in the mountains of Western North Carolina. He moved there several years ago from Connecticut. And that's why he has a one call sign while living in Portland. And uh, he's continuing to refine his very low frequency 630 meter and 2200 meter stations. During the off season, he rebuilt the whole thing and now he controls the matching coils with an Arduino remote control unit that also serves as an antenna tuner. It was quite a, trip, a project, and he says it works like a charm. He's also an advocate of slow scan TV. He operates with 300 watts using an RF Italy amplifier fed by his uh, IC7610. He has three 20 meter delta loops for that activity and recently added a phased delta loop for uh, further transmission reach. He has been doing uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, and we just had a presentation on Earth, Moon, Earth. And he's made 13 QSOs with a very humble EME station consisting of two 10 element 2 meter Yagi antennas and a Tokyo high power 300 watt amplifier driven by a Yezu 818, which is a QRP reader. Also, he's also been uh, monitoring the uh, GOES and the NOAA weather satellites, and uh, he enjoys the images that he's getting uh, along with those. He's receiving daily geostationary GOES satellite uh, transmissions and low orbit notes. In 2018, he developed and tested a small footprint 630 meter antenna that won honorable mention at the ARRL antenna design contest. It was a fun project and it worked, but it was a little bit difficult to tune from day to day due to its small size. So I'm sure he's going to tell us about the improvements he's making on that. And tonight he's assisted uh, by Brandy N1HO uh, because he's getting over an illness. So uh, David, please go right ahead and welcome. Thank you very much for presenting to us. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, sounds like I've been spending too much time in ham radio. <laughs> uh, I live in an HOA too. And uh, when we moved in here, uh, about an acre of property, and about half of it is in woods. And uh, no, I noticed that nobody around me had developed their woods, and it was all just wild. And I said, hey, do you mind if I, what I do in the woods, if I put a couple of wires up in the woods? And my HOA said, no, we don't care what you do in the woods. So I think I've got like eight antennas out there now. But uh, I've got one more year to go, and then I can claim eminent domain, and there's nothing they can do about it. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> let's talk about uh, low frequency now. Uh, let me get the uh, my slide back up here. There we go. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, low frequency operation. We affectionately call ourselves the cellar dwellers here in uh, here in Western North Carolina and South Carolina, and I believe there's one in Tennessee now. And uh, we are the low frequency operators, and uh, that is not a picture of my shack there. The shack looks just a little better than that. Let's give you a little bit. Of, can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes, you sound good. Okay, great. Let's. Okay, let's give you a little bit of history of 630 meters. It's really pretty fa pretty fascinating. It's got a long story. Uh, it was the maritime calling distress frequency uh, between 415 and 495 kilohertz since 1906, and uh, it was it, it, and that's what it was used for all this time. But uh, recently, they did away with the maritime distress calling frequencies because the automated satellites and GPS systems really ended the need for the maritime CW operations. So they in nineteen or in two thousand six, <coughs> they uh, there were a couple of ham radio operators that contacted the FCC and said, "Hey, you're not using this. Can we play with it?" And they were given experimental license to play with it, which they did for a couple of years. And there were originally 23 stations who were licensed to experiment down in the lower bands. And they found <coughs> when conditions are just right, you can do transcontinental QSOs. And they've been done at less than five watts, which was really pretty amazing. Now, from about uh, 2000, 
oh, about 2014 on, we were still experimenting with that. And uh, from 2014 to about 2018, there were approximately 63 hams that uh, held experimental licenses for 630 meters. And I was one of those original 63. And we basically got to play on that before anybody else did for a couple of years. And it was a heck of a lot of fun. Then in March 30th of 2017, approval finally came. And on 630 meters, we were limited to five watts uh, EIRP, radiated power. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but as you'll see, it works out very, very well. On 2200 meters, it's even more restrictive. We've got about, uh, what, about two and a half kilohertz, two kilohertz there to play in, but we only are allowed a one watt EIRP. Now, one of the things that's you got to remember when you're doing this is you aren't allowed to be within uh, one kilometer of a power line that uses the uh, what they call the power line communications. The grid, different uh, companies on the grid talk to one another over their power lines, and they're right around uh, 630 meters. And they were concerned that our radios would interfere with those power lines. That's been uh, pretty much proven that it doesn't, doesn't happen, but they didn't want us to be there anyhow uh, with it very close to those power lines. So before you operate on 630 meters, you have to file for what they call the Utilities Technology Council approval to operate on these bands. And it's very simple. You go to the ARRL website, there's a link to a form there that you fill out. And if you don't hear anything back from UTC within 30 days of submitting your application, you're good to go. They do not allow mobile operations on, uh, on these uh, bands, and it's pretty much a safety issue. And it, we're limited to uh, 500 watts uh, power into the system, and that's a safety consideration, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All modes of operation are allowed, although I think you'd have some pretty, uh, pretty bad words said about your operation if you tried to do a single sideband voice, a uh, single sideband phone on these because the bands are so narrow. So most of the operation is uh, FT8, FT4, uh, JT65, I'm sorry, JT9, and uh, of course, Whisper, which is where I spend a lot of my time working, because Whisper is absolutely ideal for testing out how well your station works uh, as you're developing it. And I'm running Whisper, by the way, as we speak here. Uh, I, 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 I'll run it all night long and we'll see how well it does. And it, uh, it, this evening doesn't look like it's going to be as good as it was last night, but we'll see. Now, there are a lot of common misconceptions about 630 meters. The first is that 7 kilohertz is way too narrow and the QRM is really too great to operate there. But uh, once we get into the digital modes, that's really not an issue at all. Also, a lot of people think they won't be heard without an amplifier, but as you'll see here in a little bit, that's not true at all. And operating at five watts EIRP is really, really getting down there. And it's easy to make uh, QSOs the whole way across the country during the winter months with this, with both bands. A uh, big uh, complaint is they live on a postage stamp, so an effective antenna is impossible. And we uh, will get into the, that a little bit later. And uh, both Brandy and I have experience with operating on the uh, small plot, small plot uh, with the smaller antennas. And I think you'll find that pretty interesting. One of the continual problems that we hear is there's no amateur equipment available to transmit on 630 meters. To some extent, that's true. Uh, there are some things that you have to build yourself, but there are other things that you can purchase off the shelf and with a little bit of tweaking work really, really well. So if you're interested in 630 meters, the question's always, well, where do I start? Well, you go back to the early days of antenna design. Now, for those of you who are operating vertical antennas, you know the typical vertical is one quarter of a wavelength. That becomes a bit problematic whenever we're dealing with these really lower bands because 
A quarter of a wavelength at 630 meters means your antenna would have to be 517 feet tall. And of course, that's way outside of the FCC's limits of 200 feet. And a 2200 meter antenna would have to be 1,804 feet tall if you're dealing with a quarter wavelength. So this has been a problem since the beginning of radio. And basically what these guys did was they uh, came up with uh, different systems to allow themselves to operate on shorter antennas uh, by providing additional inductance to those antennas to cancel out the capacitance, which you always get from a shortened antenna. So if you look back at the beginning, uh, you can find some really fascinating stuff. And this is really interesting. This picture on the right here, does anybody know what that is? Curtain antenna? No. Huh? Is that a curtain antenna? Yeah, well, yeah. well it, originally, it originally wasn't a curtain. It originally was a four square. This was the antenna that was used on Marconi's first transmission. This was in New, Newfoundland on his first transmission across the Atlantic. And the night before they did the test, they had a massive storm. And this was all that was left of the antenna the next day. So uh, three quarters of the antenna came down and that was what was left. And that was what they made the first transmission on. Okay, so, uh, whoops, I think, I'm, no, I didn't miss a slide. So let's talk a little bit about uh, hardware requirements. Uh, if you're going to operate on the low bands, you're going to need a couple of things. And one of the places where you have to spend a lot of time thinking about it is in your loading coil. Uh, this is the, uh, of course, uh, uh, what it does with any, any short antenna, any electrically short antenna. It has a lot of capacitance associated with it, and the loading coil adds inductance that cancels the capacitance in the electrically short antenna. You have to, on these bands, plan for adjustability because the impedance match is going to vary from day to day. And in my case here, a lot of that has to do with the uh, ground and the ground, uh, the ground radials. I live in an area of the country that's in the uh, mountains of North Carolina, and it'll get really, really pretty cold here at night, and the ground will freeze. Then as we go into the day, it will thaw out, and that changes the uh, resistance of the ground on the return path. So I find that not so much on 630 meters, but truly on uh, 2200 meters, that you spend a lot of time readjusting your antenna based on what the ground is looking like from day to day. Uh, these coils can tend to be very big if you've got a really, really small antenna, and uh, they may require up to uh, 1,000 microhenries, and that depends on your antenna and dimensions. Uh, as your antenna gets bigger, you need less of a coil, obviously. Radials are a big uh, concern here. Uh, controlling ground losses is absolutely critical on the lower bands and it requires a lot of radial density right at the base of the antenna because uh, the way these things are designed, a lot of your radiated energy is going to occur right between your coil and the beginning of the base of your antenna. A typical uh, operation like this may have as many as 70 to 100 radials. They're anywhere from 150 to 300 feet long. I have 146 radials, uh, actually 145. My dog pulled one out yesterday uh, okay. that are uh, right around 100 feet long. So I've got a lot of radials on my property. Low pass filter is something that's important. Uh, to, uh, and this is, they're not hard to build. Low pass filter is really easy to build. But if you don't uh, have a low pass filter somewhere in place, the harmonics that come off of these uh, these antennas and these uh, 630 meter systems can put you outside the FCC rules pretty quickly. And uh, they also re results in lost signal strength as you get into all these different uh, harmonics, harmonics radiating. If you can uh, get rid of that, it works much better. Impedance transformers, typically, these antennas are uh, lower impedance than 50 ohms, so very often you've got to uh, step it up. Uh, you could, uh, you've got several different alternatives here. I have used uh, type 43 and type 77 toroids. They're multi-tap. I'll show you what they look like here in a minute. 
And uh, we also have a direct shunt coil match opportunities, which I think Brandy's done a little bit of. And uh, L networks, which are typically the L and T network type deals that you see in your uh, commercially available antenna and tuners. Although you can't use the commercially available antenna tuner because they aren't available because they don't go down to 630 meters. The last thing which you may need is some radios will transmit down 630 meters now, but a lot will not. So you're going to be looking at a transverter, which allows your transmitter to operate out of band. So I, I built one that operates in the 80 meter band. The transverter convert transverts the signal down to 475 uh, kilohertz and then pushes it out through the antenna. Now, this is basically what uh, your loading coil might look like. This is actually a loading coil that uh, gives me a whole heck of a lot of uh, variability in the inductance. My main loading coil is on the outside of this Lowe's bucket here. And uh, that coil from here to here has about uh, 800 microhenries of inductance. Now this little coil on the inside rotates around the bigger coil. They are connected in series. But as you rotate this one around, it tends to buck the inductance here or add to the inductance if you get it perpendicular to it. So basically what you can do is you can tune your antenna and then as the ground losses change, depending on the uh, humidity and the humidity of your soil and the freezing state of your soil, you can rotate this little knob right here and it rotates this piece inside and you can add or subtract inductance as needed to keep your antenna matched. And over here we have uh, a typical loading our low pass filter, which consists of a couple of capacitors and a couple of inductors and that strips out all of those harmonics that uh, you would otherwise have. And again, this may, may or may not be necessary depending on what uh, type of equipment you're using, and we'll get into that. Now, there are a lot of opportunities with the 630 and 2200 meter loaded coils. And the, like we said earlier, they provide the required inductance to resonate electrically short antennas. It's important in these coils to pay attention to the spacing between turns. You can see here, we've got a little bit of spacing between these turns. Because if you get if you get them too close together, too far apart, you can give uh, you can have a lot of stray capacitance going on in this coil, and uh, that reduces the the efficiency of it. The general rule is to make the antenna boxy, make it uh, so if you're looking at it at, at length, looks like this this black one right here. Make it look so it looks like a box. And you've got it no greater than a uh, oh about a two to four. I'm somewhere between a two to one and a four to one ratio of uh, height to diameter. So these longer coils are not going to work as well. They'll provide uh, a, the, the, uh, a, you can get the same amount of inductance out of them, but they're going not going to work as well as these because these will these uh, longer and shorter coil longer coils which have a shorter diameter, will have a lower quality factor than the uh, more boxy coils. Now, it's important in these antennas too, and I'm gonna get into this in a minute, to have some top hat capacitance in them because with the more, uh, the more uh, top hat capacitance you provide in your antenna, the fewer turns you need on your coil to provide the inductance to match the capacitance or to cancel the capacitance and that that uh, means you're going to lose less power and it's going to have a lower voltage on top of the coil which is going to result in a little bit more safety now there is a a, a, a thing available from a guy named brian beasley I, he lives out in your part of the country his call sign is k6sti and it's his coil calculator and here you can see i have two coils one has a diameter of 24 inches and a length of 12 inches. And that's actually my coil that I use right now uh, on uh, 2200 meters. And you can see here that at a frequency of uh, 2200 meters, that provides me with a Q of 659. Now, if I change those numbers around and shrink that, so I've got a diameter of eight inches, 
and a coil length of 24 inches, so it's a much longer coil, I get the same amount of inductance. <coughs> Excuse me. I get the same amount of inductance out of it, but the quality factor is much lower at 420 versus 659. Now, what's that mean? Well, it means it, it changes your current distribution and the dampening of the uh, antenna, the signal going out the antenna. When you get down into uh, a lower quality factor, you tend to have more of your current concentrated down around the ground and then you get into a lot of losses uh, because of the, the typical losses due to the ground. But if you can get that Q factor up, you're driving that current further up that antenna, you're reducing your losses down here and you get a much more effective system. So it pays, makes a lot of sense to spend a lot of time making your coil right. Uh, impedance transformers, in addition to matching, uh, canceling out the, uh, excess capacitance, you've got to think about impedance matching as well. Uh, the first thing that I use on my, <coughs> oh, this is terrible. The first thing that I use on my 630 meter antenna, <laughs> excuse me, on my 630 meter tunnel antenna is a toroid mix 77 you can use a 43, it's just not as uh, efficient. <laughs> and uh, what you do is you have a uh, number of turns on your, going to your uh, radio, <laughs> which is in, uh, let's see, in the green on here. <laughs> then you have a number of turns, more turns on the black wire um, to match to different uh, impedance levels. So basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get that impedance of that antenna to a 50 ohm that my uh, transmitter likes. So I've got a whole bunch of different taps on here. You can see I've got that tapped every other turn. And basically what I do is I find out what my, impede, or my impedance is of my antenna at either 630 or 2200. And then I tap appropriately to convert that to back to um, six, back to 50 ohms. Now, the thing that's really important in all this is watch and don't skimp on this right here with the wire. I wouldn't go anything less than 14 gauge wire on this thing because once you get down into thinner wire, these things can burn up really, really quickly. And when we were experimenting with this early on, we pulverized a couple of these things because we didn't have a robust enough system. Yes. Somebody ask a question? No? Okay. Now, uh, linked uh, coupling will impact coil reactants. I wouldn't worry about that too much right now, but uh, just uh, pay attention to that because the reactants can change when you get in a link coupling situation. And if you get a meltdown in your system, it's typically going to happen somewhere in this connection right here. So you've got to have a pretty robust system in here, if uh, particularly if you've got a relatively short antenna, because this is where you're going to concentrate a lot of your energy. This is where you're going to lose a lot of your energy. We took got one of those uh, those uh, heat gu heat guns measuring devices at Lowe's once and put on this thing as we did a two minute transmission. And it was really interesting. We could drive that thing up and down ten degrees Fahrenheit in two minutes uh, by just by just by transmitting it. Uh, I think it was about 57, 58 watts here at the shack to get uh, five watts EIRP. The third piece, and this is what I use on 2200 meters, is an L-matching network. And this can be used instead of the toroid-based transformer. And this is basically what you see in your commercially available trans transmitters. Uh, you get, uh, your, you're over here in your shack, you want 50 ohms, you run it through a coil in combination with a capacitor, yeah. you adjust the capacitor on the coil, and uh, you eventually get to a place where you've canceled out most of your impedance in your antenna. And this is a system I used to use 
this was taken out of an old amplifier. That was a that was a, a I think an eighty microhenry coil, a little vacuum capacitor. It was a one thousand pf picofarad capacitor, and it was set up like this. And I would go out and manually tune it, and then I would transmit. Then the ground would freeze, and I would go outside and manually tune it. Then overnight, you know, in the morning the ground would thaw out, and then I would go out and manually tune it, and so on and so forth. A lot of running back and forth got rid of that so this is the current configuration uh, although you can't see it real well here i have a four wire marconi radiator there are four wires here on this little t that's down here they go up 75 feet way up into a tree and when it gets to the top I have 10 100 foot cap capacitance uh, hat wires that uh, fan out in all directions. Uh, that's for the 20, basically for the 2200. With the 630 meters, it's not that much of a problem because 75 feet with 10 capacitance hats is getting fairly close to 630 meters. And I only need a couple of turns on this variometer right here. So I've got this variometer here, and you can't see it back here, but my, uh, my, toroid my toroid impedance match device is back here so it goes the signal comes in goes through the impedance match the variometer and then on up into the antenna now with the 2200 meter it's a little bit different i've got a bank of high voltage uh, mica caps that provide the uh, capacitance and they go from 120 to 4000 p at pipe peak of farads a variable inductor which is this green and red thing here and they're all connected to automatic relays so I can tune everything within the shack. And I built a nice little tuner that will identify what the best match is uh, with an Arduino and it uh, will tune that automatically for me. In between all this, I have a couple of five kilovolt vacuum coax relay switches for switching uh, between 630 and 2200 meters. And I can also operate that from within the shack so I don't have to go outside and switch anything around. But that's a very uh, important system right here. Brandy's going to talk about that a little bit later and why it's important to have something that's uh, going to give you a lot of uh, kilovolts there because we're operating uh, in a not in a, in a rather rather difficult environment here electrically then i have 150 radials uh for a 16,500 feet of total wire down on the ground and the system seems to be getting a little better over time because those wires are burying themselves down under all this ivy i've got there this is what the l match unit looks like you can barely see a couple of the caps down here this is the uh inductor part of that L match right here. I've got uh, the ability to change these up and down depending on what uh, time of the year and how cold or how hot it is outside. And what I've got each of these tied to is a series of automotive relays. And I, then the Arduino in the shack will select the appropriate auto relay for the capacitance, the appropriate auto relay for the inductance, and then that uh, provides the match that I need. So I've got a happy uh, radio here at 50 ohms. Now you can also build home brewed, uh, talking about transverters now, you can also build a home brewed transverter to uh, take your out of band radio and get it to transmit at 474.2 kilohertz. This was my very first one. It had uh, one watt in at, at uh, 3.674.2 megahertz. And that provided eight watts out at 474.2 kilohertz. And I did do fairly well on it, although that's still pretty limiting at eight watts. I was getting about uh, about half a watt EIRP out uh, with that uh, transverter. Better solutions, uh, monitor sensors, transverters. I can't say I can't say too much good about them. They're great. Uh, they're expensive but they have many built-in operator error management features. Um, I, this thing back here, I can't tell you how many times I would forget to turn my radio down to one watt before using that thing. And then this piece over here would go off like a rocket and I would have to replace it. Okay, so you've got the monitor sensors. They're out of Australia. They're really, really good. And what I really like about the monitor sensors is they've got a superb uh, receive filter in them. 
So uh, this is not just a transverter to get you on 630 meters for transmit. It also does a great job on receiving, so you don't have to need you don't need a second antenna with it. One antenna will do you, and I only have one antenna here. A lot of people have separate receive antennas versus transmit antennas. One of the original cellar dwellers down in South Carolina is set up like that. And there are several lower power, less costly alternatives. The uh, uh, MF Solutions Transmit Converter Kit yeah, will give you 20 watts out uh, with about a watt in or a little less than a watt in, and it works really well too. But again, it doesn't have a lot of the safety features that the monitor sensors has. So I really think this one's worth it. Now, how small can you go with these things? Well, ARRL had a contest. They said, let's see if you can build an antenna that's uh, only 30 feet tall, 50 feet uh, wide, and 50 feet long on the radial system. And this was the one that I built uh, for that. Uh, it worked. It worked well. Uh, but it was really a nightmare in tuning. It uh, was very, very narrow, narrow, and it was very sensitive to everything that was going on in the ground as things changed from literally hour to hour. So there was a lot of running back and forth outside to tune a thing, tune a thing. But we did it just as an experiment to see if we could do it. So it can be done. Now let's talk a minute about EIRP. Equivalent isotropic radiated power. Five watts doesn't sound like a whole heck of, heck of a lot, uh, but uh, but but uh, it can be done. Uh, the matching units are going to matching units are going to gobble up transmitter pow, pow, power, so you're going to have to pay a lot of attention to quality in your antenna design. Five watts EIRP is going to require a significant amount of power at the transmitter and uh, when we talk about safety brandy talks about safety you're going to see why they limit it to 500 watts pretty quickly uh, eirp calculations i'm not going to get into this a lot you can look at look that up on the web uh, eirp calculations are very uh very straightforward uh the rig expert aa30 and also now the uh what are those things called, Brandy? The little little cheap ones I've forgotten. But uh, you've got several alternatives for measuring uh, EIRP at the now. Okay. I don't uh, recall there is off the top of my head. Yeah, I've got it over here, but I, I'm not going to go look at for it right now. But it's a little cheap unit. They work very well. Um, there's this guy named KB5NJD, John Landridge, who did a lot of the original work on this. I was unable to find the link to this uh, piece of software. I know it's out there. But basically what you do is you measure resistance at your resonance point through your inductor coil, take the coil out, determine what your antenna capacitance is, mm -hmm. put the numbers in right here to specify what your frequency you're at, how, uh, what, your, what your height is, what your capacitance is for your antenna, your total resistance and your power input, and it will tell you what you're getting in terms of output. Uh, one of the things that you'll learn from this is height matters a lot in short antennas. In a very short antenna, every foot you go up increases to the, your efficiency 10% relative. Uh, so if you can, uh, you know, if you can put up an antenna that's 40 feet and you've got an extra two feet above that, go for that extra two feet. Uh, we want to put a lot of top hat capacitance in it because this means less turns on the coil and that means more efficiency and of course less total resistance and reduced ground losses mean more efficiency and that's why i ended up putting so many radials on mine there's also another site that you can visit on this 472 kilohertz.org uh, they've got a system on there that's uh give you an approximation of uh, what your EIRP is going to uh, be. And I've tested this several times with several different antennas and it actually works pretty good. Performance, what to expect? Well, uh, KC4SIT, Silent Key now, he was one of the original cellar dwellers and he would typically pour, put in a nightly performance that looks, looked pretty close to this. Uh, he would get between uh, 80 and 100 uh, contacts a night on Whisper, and he even got down to Australia several times. That's pretty amazing given that we were operating a 5 watts EIRP. 2,200 meters at 1 watt EIRP is a little bit more uh, 
a little bit more restrictive. I was actually only able to get up to 0.31 watts EIRP with the system I've got at that point in time. It was a minus 12 dBi on that. And this is typically what I would see from night to night. And that's what to expect during the winter months. When summer comes and uh, propagation goes down, it's all going to look like the 2200 meter there. And this is typically what Ernie would do in July and I would do something fairly similar. And this is in here for comparative purposes relative to what we would do in the winter. So we're just now getting back into the season. On a good night, transcontinental contacts will frequently occur. I've made several uh, transcontinental contacts. I think Brandy's had several. I know that uh, Doug down South Carolina's had several, uh, both to Spain and England. So if you get a really good night, uh, it's, it's very doable. Here are some hardware examples. Other routes that you can go are the QRP Labs U3S transmitter. This is a buy it, build it yourself. You can then wind a, a 630 meter coil bank in here, attach a GPS clock right here, take all this, run it through an old audio amplifier. Interestingly enough, the Haffler amplifiers will go up to about uh, 300 kilohertz, uh, they go from 0.15 hertz to 300 kilohertz, one of the only amplifiers that ever did that, so you can repurpose it for transmitting, and then you put an impedance transformer in and a band pass filter, and you're good to go on 2200 meters. This is what I used on 2200 meters to begin with. I have since retired this piece over here, and I now uh, use uh, my own homebrew uh, matching system into this amplifier, and I got rid of all this right here. Okay, Brandy, it's your turn. Brandy's going to talk about the uh, neat stuff now, the safety, how to avoid becoming a Darwin Award winner. I assume everybody <laughs> knows what the Darwin Awards are, and the anybody first... can become a Hall of Flame member with this. So, Brandy, it's all yours. First of all, I'm going to disclaim uh this picture because this is not me this i think was either ernie or david early on but i would like to point out it's a cage antenna they've got what uh eight i think eight uh, wires in a circle uh used for the vertical portion of the antenna and i am doing something similar to that here in north carolina with my uh inverted l i go up 60 feet with uh, eight wires in an eight inch circle and what that does is broadens the uh, SWR response on both 630 and on 2200. So I have a beautiful looking SWR curve. Next slide. David, I need you to uh, click this. So some of the things, well, David uh, measured these, uh, made these measurements and yeah, at 500 watts going into, uh, from an amplifier going into an antenna system where you hope to get five watts of EIRP, you will generate several kilovolts uh, on, on that coil. You've got to be very, very careful. Next slide. This is what happens when you're not so careful. These are pictures that I took at my home in Florida. The one on the left, I discovered after a few nights of not being able to figure out why my uh, AA54 meter was saying, you've got a great match in the shack on 472. Why is your amplifier going nuts? went out there and discovered this on the left. I have uh, a um, zero 05 antenna. This one was the one cut for uh, 20 meters, 20 meter quarter way vertical, to which I attached a 40 foot wire going over to the top of an avocado tree. So the whole antenna was like 16 feet up, 40 feet over. Very, very short antenna, even for 80 meters. I bet nobody in the room knows what the voltage limit is on a PL259. No guess. 
250 volts? It's 500 volts, and it's 500 volts for type N connectors as well. And this particular wire was a number 12 house wire, but I had wrapped several layers of ordinary uh, Scotch 35 tape around it before shoving the wire up into the PL259 and soldering to the center pin. The uh, ceramic insulator on the right, well, that was a nylon insulator, but because my antenna system, it was so short, it arced over one night. Go ahead and next slide. This is a picture of my coil down in Florida. Uh, it's about uh, 22 inches high, about 16 inches in diameter. This is after I replaced, uh, let's see, yeah, this is the replacement antenna. I'm now running a 30 meter quarter way vertical. But if you look carefully at the right hand edge of the photo, you'll see the black insulator between the antenna and its base, that 05 built. You'll see very carefully right above the black insulator, you'll notice a screw and a little yellow uh, insulator or whatever sleeve on that wire going up to the left. Go ahead, David. Uh, going up to the top of the coil is now hardwired in there to avoid this sort of arcing problem. Amusingly enough, I tune or fine tune my SWR curve by moving that wire a little bit to its left or right. So it's not quite parallel to the antenna or the coil. That shifts the resonance of that system enough to bring the uh, SWR right in where I want to be on, in any given portion of the band. The matching transformer on the left where you see the coax plugging in is very similar to what David was uh, pointing out. That steps down the re res resistance, the R portion of the impedance. It's been, we've, by the time the uh, wire, by the time current comes back, uh, is coming out of the top of that transformer, the capacitance has been canceled out and all you're left with is pure resistance, but it's at a wrong value typically. It might be at 40 ohms, it might be 45, it might be 60. That's what the taps at the bottom of the little gray box is for. That transforms the R portion back down to 50 ohms into the coax and back into the shack. Next slide. Yeah, it looks like one of David's experiments, but it could have just as easily been one of mine. Yeah, this is a, a reiteration of what David said earlier. Um, <laughs> wind lightning, of course, is gonna be a major consideration. Down in Florida, my antenna is only 16 feet high, but the uh, I have several overhead power lines nearby. They're far enough away that my 40 foot wire, if it breaks away from the tree, won't hit those wires. But the nice part is those uh, power lines are up high enough. They attract the lightning, not my antenna. Go ahead, Dan. Here's a list uh, that uh, David had compiled and which I've used. The 472kilohertz.org is extremely useful. A lot of links to other sources. A lot of them may look, you know, you may look at it or follow some links and they'll look like they hadn't been maintained in years. Yet the information in them is still very, very usable. And as David showed you earlier, that uh, antenna calculator is very, very important because it will tell you once you measure your antenna, and that's that's the trick to all this, you, you build an antenna, I don't care if it's an inverted L or a T or some other shape, 
The trick is to find its self-resonant frequency. Uh, uh, David uses an AA30, I use an AA54. Use that uh, antenna analyzer to find the point at which there is no reactance. And that will tell you, maybe it's some other weird frequency. My, my inverted L here in Hendersonville has a self-resonant frequency of 1,043 kilohertz. Nowhere's near the amateur bands. That's irrelevant. The point is, it's at J0 at that point. Pure resistance. That resistance is your ground resistance. And mine today, I was out there, was 25.2 ohms. You feed that into that calculator, and it will tell you everything else you need to know, including how much power. And I was using it. I can run 44 watts into my antenna system here in North Carolina. I do so with a homebrew amplifier uh, that's designed by uh, WB4JWM, who's down near Augusta, Georgia. Did a lot of work on this. And the, the key thing is <laughs> the only way to adjust the power is to adjust its input voltage. And I mean the DC input voltage. It's a class D amplifier. It's a weird bird, class D. Basically, you're switching square waves. You're tickling it with, I don't know, milliwatt and a half coming out. I use a K3. It's set up. You, get, you use a transverter output right on 472 kilohertz. Uh, tickle the amplifier with 1.5 milliwatts. All you're doing is flipping a large FET back and forth at that speed in the you know mid, mid half a megahertz or so the trick is that its output impedance of that of that switching amplifier or a switching transistor is about four ohms so there's an internal network inside the amplifier to transform it up to 50 ohms just like any other transistor amplifier except that also takes care of filtering out the harmonics because as we all know, square waves is a bunch of odd, uh, odd exponent uh, components, it, you know, frequency tripled, frequency to the fifth, and so on, or you got all those extra frequencies in there. They all get filtered out. You end up at 50 ohms with 40, 50 watts of pure RF. You look at it on a scope, it's gorgeous. Uh, next slide, please, David. And there we are. Okay. So that's it. Do we have any questions, comments, or seller blueprints? I got. I want to mention one thing here that um, Brandy didn't talk too much about. This is worth a visit to this website right here. Antennas by N6LF. He is actually located not too far from where you guys are at, and he did this these chapters, chapters one through six of his 630 meter experiments. They're on his website. I keep them downloaded, especially that second chapter is really, really good to help you understand uh, what you need to what you need to build to make an effective uh, 630 meter system. So uh, that's uh, really, really worth worth the time and effort to uh, take a look at that. OK, so uh, questions, any comments? And... I've got several questions regarding your, your uh your radial system and are about the loading coils uh, in your David in your uh, description of the 146 and now 145 uh, uh, ground radials what what gauge wire are you using and did they initially get uh, dug in or were they laid across the top of the soil yeah they were uh, basically at that point in time when I was building it whatever whatever I could find at the resale stores. So some of them are smaller gauge right around uh, literally 18. I have a couple 18 gauges out there. Uh, a lot of 16 and 14 gauges and a couple of 12s. Uh, so it, it just varies. It just varies. They were originally laid on top of the ground. Uh, I have a lot of trees, you know, that produce a lot of um, 
lot of uh, debris at the end of the year that becomes soil. And I tend to throw a lot of things out there. So they, uh, the ivy is there. So they have gone down into the ground over time. But it'll work. It'll work well if you just lay them on top of the ground. I don't take the time to, you know, cut cut notches and put them into the ground manually. All right. And, then, and they can be any length. My second question is that you mentioned a four to one ratio on the uh, diameter of the wire versus spacing on the coils. Is that is that for for both six thirty and for twenty two hundred? Uh no, I wasn't talking about. I wasn't talking about the diameter of the wire. Uh, let me go back here for a minute and see if I can find this. I think we're actually discussing the, the spacing or the gap between each revolution or on, on each coil. Yeah, I'll find it here in a second. Hey, he's there he's talking go. about the width to the height ratio of the uh, coil form. Oh, so is it correct? Is that the overall form and not, not uh, yeah yeah if you really want to if you really want to get into this uh the diameter on this one would be about 12 inches the height would be about 12 inches so that would be a that would be a one to one ratio this one right here that diameter was about six inches that was about 18 inches so that would be a three to one now as can't far see where you're pointing Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong. I'm on my slide. So you're uh, you're you're about. I'm about 12 inches across here. Okay. And about 12 inches high right here. So that's a one to one ratio right there. This one right here is about six inches, and it's about 18 inches long. So that's about a three to one. Now the spacing between the wires. We're really getting down into the weeds now. The ideal spacing between the wires is 1.7, the diameter of the wire that you're using. <laughs> okay. All right. So the, almost two to one. All right. Thank you. Yeah. It's some idea for, for you know, construction of one and, and what, what it would take to do it. Yeah. And Brandy and I are used, both using these PVC uh forms that we built uh, out of stuff that we got from Lowe's. That's one way to do it. There are multiple ways, multiple ways to multiple ways to build those things. Do you find uh, it an impedance uh, shift when it's raining versus when it's dry on the antenna system? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's 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 just it's a consequence of the amount of uh, um, amount of uh, moisture I'm getting in the ground. Yeah, and it will change dramatic. It will, well, not not real dramatically. It will change when it change. What what causes the dramatic change is when I get the when I get we get a real cold night in the winter, and the, it freezes at night, then thaws out in the morning. All right. And how many people in the United States are currently uh, operating on these two bands? Is it a lot of people when they're slowly shifting? That's a really good question. Um, I, I would, I would estimate, I would estimate that there are four to five hundred people that are operating on the bands on any a given night. You'll find about a hundred, a hundred and twenty of them. All right. And is our current licenses now, uh, you know, give us grant us permission to operate it, or do we have to get an experimental license like we discussed earlier? No, no need for the experimental license any longer. Uh, after the approval, after the approval, there was no need for an experimental license. Uh, all you need to do is get the uh, UTC UTC clearance, and you're you're good to go. Now you can still get an experimental license for them, and some people do because they want to uh, do some uh, esoteric uh, es esoteric uh, transmissions with it transmissions with it or just do a little bit of experimenting uh, at different areas of the bands and uh, some oddball things. Uh, so you can get an experimental license for it if there's some specific valid reason that you can provide to the F FCC. But okay. no, you don't need one anymore. And I'm sure our, our frequency frequency chart, you know, probably spells it out in there, but I never bought 
time to look because I stop at 80 meters. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I'm sorry. Was that a question? No, no I'm just, just just saying that, that I'm, okay. it's probably written on the, the frequency, you know, privilege chart that I've just never looked at. Yeah. Well, uh, I was going to say, I think the real question is, how do I shove this in my attic to please my HOA? <laughs> uh, I got to tell you. I would not be shoving this in my attic. <laughs> this, not unless um, you have the asbestos attic. <laughs> just, I'm not sure just, to just, uh, I got to tell you what I did one night with this thing. Just for the heck of it, I went into my shop and I have these, uh, I have these uh, six foot long, eight foot long uh, fluorescent tubes. Okay. So I popped one out of my shop. And I walked it out into the woods. I got about six feet away from this thing, and I lit up the entire woods. So there's no <laughs> way I'd be putting one of those in my attic. <laughs> now, I've seen demonstrations like that before with Tesla coils, you know, at very, very high frequency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty impressive. <laughs> okay, and, and of course you could put up. Like I, like I said, you can put a uh, you can you could put a uh, one of these thermometer guns, these uh, temperature guns on it during a transmission, and you can monitor it. And particularly if you're using an impedance coil, there is just no way I put a, put one in in an attic because I've Ernie and I used to burn them up uh, periodically while we were learning what we were doing with this. So it's much safer to put it in the woods. <laughs> yeah, so I put it in the woods. If I if I end up if I end up if I end up creating a fire up at the top, I've got a real problem. <laughs> Here in California, I know we have that problem. <laughs> oh, okay. Any other questions? Well, David, I want to say thank you very very much on behalf of the Senate for getting on the radio club. And Brandy, we certainly appreciate you. Uh, helping out and, and uh, spelling David when he when he needed to have a, a small break. So we welcome you and thank you very much. We will be posting uh, this video on our uh, our Facebook page, which is W6JW uh, Santa Clarita Amateur Radio Club uh, Facebook page. And our call sign is easy to remember. It's Whiskey Six Johnny Walker. Say that again. <laughs> Our, our, call, our call sign for the club is Whiskey Six Johnny Walker. W6JW. And our Facebook page is W6JW San Marino Amateur Radio Club. We'll have it posted there. So it'll, it'll probably be about a week or so. But once again, we thank you very much. We appreciate you. Both of you. Thank you. I do have one request from you. Sure. Do not let anybody in my HOA know I'm doing this. <laughs> not for a couple of years at least, right? Yeah. <laughs> we face that same issue here. So thank you very, very much. Okay. Uh, really appreciate we, it. we certainly thank you a great deal. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks you. You're welcome. Thank you for staying up late. <laughs> oh, you're Pleasure. Welcome.